So, um, before we get started, let's get something straight because someone had mistaken this had to be Shrek. It's not, it's Yoda. All good there? Great. Um, be happy to get my screen working. No, it's okay. I think it's coming back. Thank you. All right, cool. So, um, we're going to have more security talks today, which is, I don't know, expected, I guess. Um, so, Introducing myself, my name is Iran Tal. I work at Sneak as a developer advocate. Uh, we build uh, developer-friendly security tooling for open source. Some of my other f uh, projects that I'm involved with are uh, uh, Node.js. I'm part of the uh, security working group for the Node Foundation. I also uh, uh, co-maintain co on the core team for uh, OWASP NodeGoat. I have a secret passion for building CLIs, so uh, uh, something like that. And a couple of years ago, I wrote, uh, I think, one of the first books about uh, Node.js, so essential Node.js security. So I've been doing this for a while. And if you want to talk about any of these topics, welcome to ping me at Twitter, at uh, Liran underscore Tal. So uh, in this talk today, I want to take you to, uh, to a journey of understanding some horror stories, some bad things that happened in Node security ecosystem, as well as JavaScript. Um, go through, maybe if we have time, a small demo for uh, one of the vulnerabilities that is typical for Node projects, and then kind of end with a positive note about, about the silver linings in Node security. So starting off, I think we've talked about it uh, a couple of times here in this conference. Uh, NPM as the biggest ecosystem, you know, has, has actually uh, been almost surpassing uh, one million packages. Probably this will happen this year, uh, probably tomorrow or something like that, when more people publish more uh, uh, interesting and entertaining packages uh, to the registry. And what I want to talk about is that have, being the biggest repository, as NPM is, invites big risks as well. So for example, it is a very lucrative playground for attackers because infecting, malicious, being, uh, having be, being able to uh, infect or compromise one package translates into many, many open source users of this package, right? And the other thing is that NPM by itself is a very open and free to publish repository. So there's nothing like a, an automated uh, secure, a code review or a identification of who you are when you s submit something unlike things like iOS and stuff like that. So you're welcome to submit and build whatever you want and just send it off to the registry. And at this scale that NPM is, right, being a very big, big, basically the biggest repository of open source packages is having scale issues. How do you automate finding malicious packages, exploits, really bad code uh, in terms of security audit? So all of those are kind of the restarts uh, we're seeing coming uh, up and up uh, for a long time. One of those is that I'm going to talk about today is malicious packages. I want to look at it uh, with you together and see what's going on there. So when we talk about malicious packages, we can kind of uh, translate them into three ways that they manifest in. One of them is typo squatting attacks. The other one is compromised accounts being uh, happening on NPM. And so someone is able to publish a malicious model on behalf of someone else, un unwantedly of course, and a social engineering way. And all of those we've seen happening uh, through the ecosystem in the, in the past uh, couple of years. What hadn't happened yet, and oh God, please don't let it happen, is the NPM repository itself being compromised. So I hope that does not ever happen, but we can be uh, uh, you know, uh, wishful. So going back onto a timeline of understanding how malicious packages evolved, I want to start with something uh, that is kind of familiar, but just we'll, we'll uh, go through this very quickly. So RimRafol is a package that has been uh, uh, put into the registry. Uh, the way that uh, it acts as a package, you can see the package manifest. And those of you who aren't familiar uh, with the package itself, but are familiar with NPM packages, you would see that there is a pre-install script that once you install the package, uh, you would get your hard drive kind of deleted. It's a great package if you want to delete, uh, you know, browser history. So uh, this is kind of what, uh, this, is, this is built into the NPM CLI lifecycle, right? This is how things work. So when you install something, you give those permissions. Crossenv is a popular package as well that was uh, introduced into the, into the package registry. Basically what it does is it allows someone to manage environment variables. So if you heard me or someone else at a talk, uh, talk about it and you wanted to go install it and you would have typed it like that, you would get something else, not the actual Crossenv package. So what does it actually do? So crossenv is a package, malicious package, that is actually, uh, we can see here, actually um, bundling the real crossenv package, right? So it's giving you the exact same functionality, but then as we have already kind of been noticing and learning here, it also does something when it gets installed. It runs this package setup script, 
which when we look at, we're seeing that some things are kind of you know, odd and weird and not something that a package should do. There's this host name, remote host name, that's called npm.hackstack.net. Uh, that is what this script does is basically read your uh, process.n, which is your environment variables available to the process. Base64 encoding all of that so that you know, nothing maybe gets through on a WAF or something like that. Uh, putting all of that into a, a post request and sending it off. So basically when you install it, it's gonna go and eat all of your environment variables, giving you the exact same functionality, no one suspects it, but at the same time sending all of that uh, to a malicious actor. And I bet no one is saving here uh, passwords or secrets in environment variables, right? Good, glad we had that right. Uh, so that's a type of squatting attack, right? And what if I told you that one of those uh, NPM modules uh, for a very uh, popular module are also type of squatted? So take a second and try to think which one of them is, is that. Right? It's a bit confusing. Both of them are type of squatting attacks. And this is not something that happens, you know, uh, two or three years ago. If I take a look at, for example, uh, uh, vulnerabilities and you know, uh, packages that we're tracking, we can see that malicious packages have been sent in just two weeks ago. This is 14th of May 2019. Malicious package typo squatting attack that was sent in just two weeks ago trying to typo squad the popular package request, which is, uh, I assume someone had done that because request is kind of going unmaintained, et cetera, so someone is, is trying to uh, write on the same idea. So what we learned so far, we've seen post-install scripts. We're seeing uh, scripts that actually, when you install them, call home uh, to send some payload. But the question is, how are we finding out about those vulnerabilities, right? How are we finding out about this malicious package? So no one caught it, right? Not, not, not NPM, no other player in the industry. Actually, the developer caught it and posted it on Twitter because he saw that something weird is happening when he installed the package and alerted Kent, who is the original author of the, the, the OK package, right? The, the cross dash n, which is just fine to use. So this brings me to uh, just 2018, just last year, right? Mid last year, get cookies. Let's talk about it. It's an NPM package uh, that parses HTTP headers so you can work with cookie data. Or does it? So in fact, get cookies is nothing less than a command and control backdoor that allows someone to run arbitrary commands when you install it. It is so elaborate in the way that it was created that someone had actually, the malicious actor had actually put it behind several levels or layers of hiding it between something else. So someone understands how, the, how complex the NPM ecosystem is. So for example, if you were looking just at get cookies to get it, maybe you'd find it. But if, you, if it looks legit and some other packages are actually bundling it itself, maybe you don't look you know, three levels down the tree to find it. And an NPM package, a malicious package, like three of them on the, in the registry, part of being a million other packages as well, you're not gonna find it. So we need to inject it into something that is popular. So maybe we can put it into mail parser. And that's exactly what they did. They injected the top one into mail parser in some way. So let's look at these 44 uh, lines of code backdoor. It starts with something that uh, should look familiar to anyone who has been doing a uh, node or express uh, development. It has a function signature of an express middleware, a route middleware that takes the request and the response and when this gets uh, introduced into a web, uh, web service like express, uh, it allows someone to, to do something with this data. What exactly? So first of all, this backdoor allocates 64 bytes of data, uh, so it can do something with that. Uh, puts this on this uh, dot .log buffer, uh, then you know, stringifies uh, all the data from request headers and tries to find a specific pattern using this regex to pass those commands that someone is sending uh, remotely. Uh, it, for whatever reason, I don't know, uh, they had been able to format it as a little Indian, an Indian. I don't know if this is because uh, they've been trying to uh, obfuscate it or make it look complicated or not. Uh, but at, at, as we can see in the back door itself, it has, is exposing three of those commands. One of them is actually always resetting the data. So it's trying to empty the buffer, or reset it from time to time if it's needed. The last command is actually getting the JavaScript payload onto the log buffer. So whatever is get, get sent is get loaded into the log. And when it's time to all the data, all the JavaScript payload basically had been uh, tr uh, transferred over the wire, it's gonna go and execute it. So it's gonna uh, turn things into two string, require uh, this hex encoded uh, VM module, which allows you to use, sorry, to use something that's called uh, a function that is available that's called uh, run in this context and gives all, the, all of the data. So to simplify this, the way that this would work is someone would just get, send whatever request to this web server that he is available to do. 
um, use this pattern of G, uh, command, H, then data, and, and I. And this exposes the whole workflow. So for example, resetting the, uh, resetting the buffer would be G, F, E, F, F, right? And if they wanted to load some JavaScript code, they would do something similar and send this payload over the wire. When everything is done and everything is over there, we're gonna go and execute it. So this, this, really, this is, of course, a real example, right? This is really what happened uh, with Get Cookies, uh, introduced into, into, uh, into Mail Parser. And of course, this was a thing. It's, it's, let's take some observation here because it didn't really affect the entire, uh, the entire ecosystem just because it was seen very fast, uh, but also at the same time, it was seen that uh, specifically mail parser didn't do any use of, of this get cookies, um, of, the, of the top level HTTP uh, uh, fetch cookies that was introduced. But it happened and all of this code is real and made it to a malicious package that was sent in, a malicious version of a specific package that gets downloaded almost half a million times a month. So one observation that we can make here on, on what happened is that if you were trying to code review one package by, you know, one by one and go through all of those packages, you know, this will be a very time consuming and, and a very difficult uh, thing for you to do. So you need to get it right all the time while attacker is trying to get lucky once and maybe making it in. Let's talk about the ESLIN scope and see what happened there. That just happened a couple of months after, after get cookies. And ESLint scope is a child package of ESLint, the project itself. So it's a very popular static code analysis for JavaScript projects. The project itself, of course, is not malicious, just this specific version that was published. You can see it is getting downloaded quite a bit. And what was going on there is very similar to what we have seen actually before. So you already recognize this pattern. Something, when you installed it, something was calling a post install, install script and running this uh, lib build JS, which what it did was basically similar to what CrossEnv did, right? And if CrossEnv was trying to, to take your uh, environment variables, then this was actually calling paste pin, calling a remote payload to get whatever JavaScript was there. And when it got it, it evaluated it. So it received everything back, took all of your NPM or C tokens, which basically what happened, and sent them to a remote uh, uh, attacker. The thing is, what you put in NPM or C is very important. These are your tokens. And if you're a maintainer, you're publishing packages, then this gets important because now someone is able to publish packages on your name. So it's kind of like a JavaScript form that as more people install it, this spreads out and more maintainers are compromised. Funny thing is, if you are recognizing uh, the code and the mistake that was uh, happening here is it evaluated the JavaScript code on an event uh, getting the data. So for example, this could be an issue if the data itself didn't fit, uh, didn't, uh, fit into, into one uh, specific chunk of the data stream that got in. And this is how we found out about it. Someone was basically opening an issue saying, oh, I installed this link scope or whatever, uh, and I got this error, what, what's happening? This looks like a virus or something. So again, another example of this problem in the ecosystem, and we have no uh, automatic controls on the NPM ecosystem and registry to be able to, ca to catch them automatically. So someone had to bring this up. Who depends on ESLint scope? Well, just a few packages. I don't know if you've heard of them, but basically kind of powering the, ex uh, the entire uh, front-end ecosystem. So what happened is NPM, of course, had to invalidate all of, this, all of the tokens from the date of this package making it in and you know, estimating almost 5,000 uh, compromised accounts. So another observation that we can make here, right? ESLint scope published an NPM package, uh, but the malicious actors that were able to get access to ESLint scope didn't have access to the GitHub repository. So basically what happened there is that the source codes uh, on, on GitHub was different from that on, on, on the NPM published module. How does something like this happen, right? We're talking about compromised and malicious packages that are not typo squatting attack. It's not someone uh, deliberately making a package malicious, but taking someone else's package and making it happen. So what if I told you that contributors, maintainers on NPM were actually compromised? What if I told you that a security researcher had actually compromised at one point in time, 14% of all the packages on NPM, mod on NPM right? It is 20%, it's accounting for 20% of all of the NPM monthly downloads. Maybe you know some of these packages, right? So all of them at one point uh, were indeed, uh, someone was able to get public access to all of those. Uh, luckily for us, he's someone who's working with us and a good citizen, so nothing uh, bad happened, but you understand that this could have happened. How, right? 
How does something like that happen? How are you able to compromise something like Express or React or Debug? These are very popular packages downloaded by millions of millions every day. Well, it turns out from his research, about 600 users used the amazing password 123456. The one of, uh, about uh, 1,400 had used uh, the password set to their username, which is a bit better from one to six, I guess. And 11% of them, not understanding and realizing the importance of password security, had actually reused the password that was, was, uh, be, have been able to get, uh, to get that from, uh, from a data breach. So this says something you know, about the state of security, I think, in general in open source, right? Maintainers uh, who we look up to and you know, are probably amazing people, uh, but they lack some kind of you know, best practices on basic things like password security. And if something like one of those popular packages gets, uh, gets compromised and gets into malicious or you know, backdoors inside it, we had a problem because we're all using that. Everyone in this room is probably using one of those packages. I'm not going to talk about event stream too much, uh, so just kind of to sum it up, uh, it's been a popular story, uh, I think, in the JavaScript ecosystem, probably one of the most sophisticated attacks that we've seen to date. Um, there's a timeline that uh, is building a post-mortem to you know, explain exactly what happened there, but that is a different case from what we've seen so far, so not typo squatting and not compromised accounts, but actual social engineering uh, attempt to uh, send in uh, a malicious package that was able to actually target specific developers of a Bitcoin platform in order to make uh, transactions uh, to, to a third party. And, you know, it, it, we only found out about it like two months after it happened. So definitely one of the uh, most important things that we've seen so far. If you're interested to read more, you can just uh, go to this link. It brings a sec uh, third observation because specifically what happened with EventStream was that um, the code for the malicious package uh, that EventStream included by itself uh, was minified, was transpiled. You know, people used TypeScript today. So even if you wanted to code review and, and check source to, to publish the package, it's not specifically an easy task because the source can and may be different from what you have on, on the published package. So it's not a one-to-one -one, uh, match uh, all the time. This brings us to talk about dependency management, right? How do we track all of these, all of those uh, uh, packages that we have? NPM is a very convoluted place. Uh, packages are, you know, nested trees are, uh, uh, are, are a thing, if so to say. Uh, a research had shown that uh, the, uh, the average depth of any package is more than four uh, levels deep. That's pretty big to, to, to figure out exactly what's going on in a package. And many times vulnerabilities come in from uh, from just uh, uh, indirect dependencies that you have in your project. So even if you are going to go and code review every, and go into you know, change logs and, and use letter for security issues, for everything that React or Express or whatever brings in, actually most of the vulnerabilities will come in from those indirect dependencies. The exact number is about 78% of the times when we find those vulnerabilities, we find them in those indirect dependencies, not in, those di not in the direct ones. Which brings me to talk about uh, this revelation where when developers are building their apps, you know, they are thinking that they're writing a lot of code, but in reality their code is just very uh, single uh, and, and small blimps on the radar in terms of the entire application. And this is something that we're trying to raise awareness of and you know, taking more responsibility in terms of developers building their, uh, their, their applications using open source software. So maybe let's try and, and do a... One, one live demo to kind of see also typical vulnerabilities that we have uh, affecting the ecosystem. All right, so I have here, let's see how we do that. I have here uh, this example app. Uh, it has an endpoint called uh, about new. As you can see, uh, when I render something, uh, I, just, I just call it to render something on the string, on the screen. I am able to give it things like device is desktop, and then maybe it, uh, it renders it a bit smaller. And if I do something like uh, mobile, it will kind of make it, uh, uh, with CSS work, make it a bit uh, bigger. And so far, so good. If I were trying to find out what happened here, maybe I would uh, understand that this go goes in, something gets evaluated. Uh, maybe I'll try and, and escape it some way. So maybe I'll add uh, like a quote and figure out uh, maybe I can escape something that's happening, but I can't. And let's see what's, what's really happening. So to give you context into this, basically this is uh, the Dust.js uh, um, um, 
templating engine for, for, for Node.js. And it's a very popular one, not as popular as maybe handlebars, et cetera, but it's been used by you know, thousands of projects probably. And as we can see, Dust actually has this escape HTML. So it's actually trying to do something good, right? It's checking if something that I'm sending is a string. Uh, and if it does, it's going to go and, and, and uh, change and escape all of those uh, single quotes to something that is encoded into the uh, correct context of HTML. So that looks OK, except it's actually looking for a string, right? Over here. I'll go ahead and make that more readable for you. So it's actually looking for a string, but what if we were able to send it something that's not a string? It would not go through this um, uh, sanitization process. So if I, what if I were able to go and send something like this? Right, so at this point in time, maybe I'm sending something else. Maybe I'm sending, I'm doing what's uh, referred to as an HTTP parameter pollution. I'm basically sending something that looks like an array, like an object. So it's not anymore a string in the JavaScript context, but uh, when things get you know, to string, I'm gonna get the first element and I'm gonna get desktop. So when I do that and I try to maybe escape it, I'm saying that something is actually happening, right? Just to give you an example of what that looks like is Something like this. So I know that something bad is happening there and not every case is covered. And now I can go in and, and figure out what is going on with the Dust helpers. So what Dust helpers shows me is that the way Dust is built, uh, it's actually evaluating some code some, into, the, into a condition. So when I have um, code in my template like this, which is, by the way, just fine, right? This is how template engines work. They need to evaluate stuff and add some kind of logic into the something that you build, this data actually gets escaped. And then I can do a lot of stuff, like inject, uh, co inject code into it. So I can go ahead and do something like uh, escape it, um, console log it, and then I don't need to escape it uh, back again. So at that point in time, I'm actually able to send something in. Let's see. Right. There we go. So as you see, I've been able to basically append here a console log into one. And over here you see that server actually evaluated one. So evaluation happening in the way that template engines are supposed to work, but it's not always safe. And this is an example of uh, vulnerabilities that we're seeing a lot in open source packages. All right, so let's go into the positive uh, part of, of you know, the, the, the good part of the future that that's, I think is, is very interesting. So we can talk about NPM uh, as an ecosystem, right? And we talked about malicious modules and typo squatting attacks in specific. So how does NPM uh, uh, handle that? So there's React Native, for example, if I would want to typo squat it, I could have maybe sent in a package, a malicious one that's called React Native without the dash or you know different cases of it. Uh, right now, there is some kind of measures on the NPM registry to disallow you to send uh, these kind of packages because what it's going to do is going to strip all the punctuations marked like that. It's going to try and compare the packages, and if they are close enough, um, you know, they evaluate to the same thing, it will uh, not allow you to send them in. And you won't be able to publish them, except that's not smart enough, as we've seen, there are other ways of typo squatting packages. The recommended way to do that, of course, is to create a new scope. And if you really wanted to uh, use, you know, this exact uh, namespace, you could you could do it like that under your own scope and use this and use uh, React Native as it should be written. Funny thing about NPM is at one point in time, it allowed the exact same package to be created, uh, even if it's if it's different in terms of upper uppercase and lowercase. So these are actually two different packages on NPM. The fact is that right now we cannot break any one of them because breaking it will probably break the ecosystem. So this is something we have to live with for now. Another thing that NPM has added is the ability to send in notifications when packages get published. So this is kind of related to malicious packages, you know, being sent in terms of compromised accounts. Someone uh, might be getting this notification of, of, an, of his package being compromised. And uh, if he didn't, of course, publish it himself, it would raise awareness. So we have that as well. 2FA, right? Yay, we have 2FA in the registry. 
So it's been available actually for almost two years. Uh, you can enable it from the UI, from the, uh, from the uh, command line, just like that. Um, I have a quote here of Adam Baldwin, the security person uh, inside of NPM, uh, saying a couple of months ago that you know, he kind of cranked the numbers and found out that about 7% of NPM uh, packages, only those have 2FA enabled, which is a bit of a sad story. To, so of course I'm encouraging everyone here to enable 2FA. There's a flip side of 2FA, right? Um, the caveat for that is what happens if your project, and a lot of those, a lot of us maintainers actually have those automatic uh, releases. So we used to like semantic release to be able to, once we merge code, it had passed all through all tests, we we're able to go ahead and release it. Uh, so 2FA, how does that work in, right? And you're able to create tokens. Uh, you can create like a, a limited 2FA um, uh, in a way that it only uh, works for uh, login attempts, but not for publishing. So then you can use tokens. But then tokens are actually created for all of your packages, right? For all of your user, all of the access that you have. So even if I wanted to use that, that's not really helpful because someone getting uh, one token is able to compromise all of my packages. NPM kind of recommends uh, in a chat with them to uh, create a second user. The thing is, the second user has the exact same problem, right? All the tokens created for that specific user are going to be uh, uh, used for all of the packages that that user uses. So to actually, you know, kind of limit it, I would need to create a specific user for every package that I own and then just use that single token for every single package, which is, of course, not scalable. So we're hoping to see uh, more, more advancement in terms of 2FA on NPM. Um, de developers taking ownership, right? That's a really good uh, point and uh, ownership of application security. That's a really good point that we're seeing a lot in the industry. So we asked, you know, developers uh, in one of the recent reports, you know, who do you think should be owning application security? And I don't know if it's surprising a lot or not, but 81% of them are saying that, um, you know, developers should take uh, ownership. And of course, that doesn't dismisses or removes uh, the, the need for, uh, for uh, security people, right? We're going to need that expertise all the time. But developers are simply stating they are taking more ownership on like their Docker files, right? Full stack development on the cloud. They want to be empowered with good security tools that work in the way that uh, they work, right? They're not, they're not in to replace us. They're not going to be security experts. So I think one good attempt in that is, you know, we have NPM audit. It already bundles in when you install NPM and when you, when you, uh, when you scan something or when you just install, you get, you get an audit with something that uh, may be malicious. But what if security was easier? What if uh, security was more developer friendly? What if it's something that you, it is not an afterthought? What if it is just another check on your CI to make sure that nothing gets introduced in terms of a vulnerable package? What if security was more actionable for developers? What if instead of getting a report that, you know, uh, two, three, four, five, whatever packages are vulnerable, we would instead be able to help developers in this ecosystem and workflows that are very familiar to them, that we can open automatic pull requests to apply fixes, right? With really smart tools, we can, we can do that and make them more powerful. So lastly, I want to say a few words about the Node Security Working Group which is uh, what a couple of us here are taking part of. Um, I want to say basically, you know, if you need any help with security, we are here for you, right? Uh, there is a security working group working within the Node Foundation and uh, hopefully with the OpenJS uh, Foundation kind of merge, uh, maybe for the broader JavaScript ecosystem. We meet once a month. Uh, everyone are kind of affiliated uh, uh, with security expertise, but, you know, at the most part, trying to better help the ecosystem. Some of the stuff that we do in terms of improving the ecosystem is things that are related to Node Core. So, for example, a bug bounty program. Uh, another example is, um, for example, we have uh, processes um, and best practices. So processes like how do you release a new uh, security release for Node Core? How does that work? How do you announce it? Uh, we maintain our own uh, um, Hacker One. Um, uh, bug bounty program as well. So anyone who wants to actually uh, send something unrelated to, to Node, but specifically to any NPM package can send it there. And of course, maintain our own public vulnerability database out of all of this knowledge. So summing up, and just to give you an idea of what uh, the thing that the security working group has been tasked with, I do not know if you know all of those models, but React SVG, you know, serve, protobuf, base64 URL, some of those are nested dependencies of others, so you may not know them as direct dependencies, but, you know, spanning millions of downloads, all have been triaged and worked on from the security working group, and powering tools like NPM Audit and Snake, right? This is stuff that we are trying to help the ecosystem. So summarizing uh, our talk, uh, I think we talked about malicious modules, how contributors get uh, uh, compromised. 
enable 2FA for that, of course. Uh, common security pitfalls like code injection happening through, uh, on, the, on the server side through uh, insecure uh, ways of protecting uh, code. And I think the future is kind of bright. We're doing a lot of work in terms of tooling, in terms of involvement with the security working group. So there's a lot of developer awareness coming out, which is, I think is a very, 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 very good, good thing. Uh, you know, fix and find vulnerabilities in your open source dependencies and just talk to us on the working group if you have anything else. Thank you so much. Uh, if you want to talk to me about anything related to nodes, uh, the working group, security, open source, maintaining packages and difficulties, you're welcome to hit me up. Thank you.